Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gloria Waters. I'm the dean uh, here at Sargent College, and I'm really delighted to uh, welcome you to the fourth annual Meredith Drench lectures, Lecture. Um, so this lecture series began in 2009, and it was thanks to an, uh, an endowment uh, from Dr. Meredith Drench, who is a Sargent alumna and uh, one who came from our physical therapy program. Uh, after graduating as a physical therapist uh, from Sargent, Dr. R Drench earned a PhD in behavioral rehabilitation. And as a behavioral specialist, she's had a particular interest in the psychosocial aspects of rehabilitation. And so she wanted to endow this lecture series um, to give our students and faculty an opportunity to think about not just the physical aspects of rehabilitation, but all of those other important aspects um, that uh, go along with the rehabilitation process and to bridge the gap between uh, what we see in physical rehabilitation and other psychological and social influences uh, that play a really important role. And so this year, the faculty have chosen to invite Travis Roy um, to deliver the annual Drench Lecture. And as I think everybody here knows, Travis is a BU alumnus. And uh, many people in the BU community um, who were back here in 1995 uh, remember Travis's life-altering uh, hockey game. 11 seconds into his first ship, shift of his first collegiate hockey game, uh, Travis, uh, who actually first put on ice skates when he was 20 months old, I'm told, I'm really <laughs> impressed, uh, crashed into the boards. Um, and he cracked his fourth and fifth vertebrae and uh, was paralyzed from the neck down. And uh, Travis has done uh, marvelous things since then. He's really uh, turned something that was a very, very difficult situation um, into a very positive thing in his life. And um, amazingly, he returned uh, to Boston University to resume his study, studies less than a year after his accident. And um, in 2000, he graduated from BU right on schedule um, with a degree in communications. And today, uh, Travis is a motivational speaker, and he's an activist for people living with spinal cord injuries. Um, he's written a book, which I think many of you are familiar with, called uh, 11 Seconds. And um, in 1997, he started the Travis Roy Foundation, which funds research and also provides grants to spinal cord injury survivors um, so that they can purchase some of the costly um, adaptive equipment that will make their lives um, easier to live. And he's. Um, uh, done amazing things with the foundation. So we're really delighted to have Travis here. It's really uh, a pleasure to have uh, a BU alum um, and to have you, Travis, um, speak to us today. Thank you. So welcome. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Every once in a while, I'll speak at some of the different colleges, and, and it's always an honor, and uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces, Professor Powers, and Thank you for coming out, and uh, uh, Larry, who uh, uh, had the unfortunate moment or, uh, of, of being the athletic trainer at the time on the ice uh, for the hockey team and, and uh, was the first out on that ice after my injury. Um, but uh, as I say, I thought when, when I got invited to speak, I, I um, was debating, you know, exactly what, how, to sh how to share my story and what aspects to talk about and um, the psycho psychosocial uh, issues of, of my rehabilitation and, and how this whole thing has impacted my life and, and the people around me. And, and I, I was re really looking forward to it. Um, and I thought I would, I think it's important to know a little bit about me before my injury and, and who I was and how I saw myself and then walk through a little bit of the, the injury itself and the acute phase and, and how it affected my, my, my family, my friends, my relationship with society in general, and uh, some of the highs, some of the lows, and, and leave some, some, uh, some time for some questions. I, I really look forward, actually, to uh, leaving some time and, and a little bit of dialogue. And um, So hopefully I'll be thinking of some, some questions. I, I have always been pretty open and honest. I, I think if those that have read my book, um, sometimes a little too open in, in hindsight, but, uh, <laughs> but, I, uh, but I think that's, uh, that, that was probably the success, why the book was successful was, was I really let people into, into my world. Um, but, and, and I brought a few 
they, they asked me if I had any, any multimedia to, to, to bring along, and I, and I said no. And then this morning, I, I came up with the idea to just bring a few photos that kind of coincide with the different times of my life and, and physically how I saw myself and, and, and uh, who that person was at that time of my life and, and how, it's, how it's changed. Um, but, but let me just go back to the beginning. As, as you heard, at 20 months old, I, I, uh, I was on skates for the first time in my life, and, and I always enjoyed sports, and you know, hockey was certainly a passion in my life, and, and uh, from a very early age, I, I knew that that was going to be a part of my life, and uh, to, to the days of you know, 15 years old and, and my freshman year in, in high school and, and going into my bedroom and, and, and doing all the, all the hockey camps that I went to and sports camps, and it seemed like at one point or another, there was always somebody that was talking about setting goals. And, and, and I was one of those kids that actually did that. Uh, I, uh, uh, I pulled out a piece of paper and a pen, and it was a fall afternoon. And, and I had my goals, and I, I had my short-term goals of, of uh, how many goals I was going to score on the, the hockey team my freshman year and my sophomore year and junior year and, and, and different awards I wanted to win and all-star teams I wanted to play on. And I talked about going down to, to Massachusetts and playing prep school hockey, which was sort of a stepping stone uh, to, to playing at, at, at a higher level. And, and then my dream goals of, of playing Division I college um, hockey and earning a scholarship and, and, and maybe someday playing in the minor leagues, the, the, the AHL, and then to the NHL. And, and, and literally at the bottom of my list of goals, in, in red and blue markers, I, I had you know, to play on the U.S. Olympic hockey team. And, um, and so from 15 years old, I, was, I had my plan, I had my agenda, I, I knew where I wanted to go and what I wanted to accomplish. And, and as, as the years passed, it was, it, was, it was amazing, it was fun just how closely I came to checking off my goals and, and uh, my, my senior year in, at, at Tabor and having scholarship oppor opportunities from the University of Michigan to my home state school, the University of Maine, and, and, uh, and graduating that, that spring and, and, and coming to, to Boston University and, and again, playing a Division I sport. It's, a, it's very much a full-time job um, on top of just being a student. Um, and that, that summer, I, I, I found a, a host family to live with uh, over in Chestnut Hill. And, and I spent the summer uh, working at a, a, a soup and salad place, making soups and salad. And, uh, and then I would come over to, to BU every day and, and spend a, an hour or two just, just working out. And, and it was all sort of leading up to that, that dream of, of, of playing college hockey. And, and uh, yeah, you're, you're skipping on me. So this is, uh, that's all right. So that, that summer before my injury, I, I, everything was, was just falling into place. I'd had my goal, I was working out. I, I you know, I'd, I'd never been in, in, in better physical condition of my life. Um, and it was, it was almost that moment of, you know, almost things were too perfect, you know, I, I, everything was, Going along just as I planned, and uh, and and that and that kid there um, was plenty confident. Uh, I was I was always humble. I always, um, you know, if I if I when I was here that first month and a half on on campus, the last thing I was going to let somebody know was that I was a hockey player. I wanted him to get to know who I was first, because again, playing hockey on this campus, it, um, there's a little bit of of, of uh, notoriety, but uh, but I always, as I say, I wanted to be known for, for the person I saw me. And, and as much as hockey was a part of my life, um, I always wanted to be a well-rounded well -rounded person. Um, and, and when I got to campus, again, uh, the academics were, I, I, I struggled, but I was, I was, I was getting there. And, and as a freshman, I, I assume you just shut your mouth and work hard and prove you belong. and, and uh, the team was the defending national champions that year, and uh, and and there were a number of guys on the team that were clearly going to move on to the NHL and, and have successful careers. And, and and in the back of my mind, that was my that was the question that I was hoping to answer in the next few years was was could I be one of those guys? Could I 
make a living playing, playing hockey. And, um, and, and two days before our first game, Coach Parker, he called me into his office and, and, uh, and he gave me the news that I, I would play in the first game against the, the University of North Dakota and, and, and the second game against the University of Vermont, which was coincidentally my, my parents' alma mater. And, and I remember uh, going home that night. I lived in Shelton Hall. Uh, uh, the three other roommates, uh, hockey players, and, and and I, you know, I still get chills remembering calling my parents and, and just letting them know that that I was going to play in the first game and in the second game, and calling my sister, and my friends, and you know, getting coach, getting tickets for for my friends to come to that that first game, and and of course Friday, October twentieth, um, nineteen ninety five. It was my. Uh, um, I remember waking up that, that day and, and it was, you know, it was the best day of my life. Um, and uh, everything had fallen into place and, and, uh, and I remember getting to the ice arena and just being in the locker room and it, it had just been redone that far with our own style with our name etched on the nameplate above it. And there was the scarlet red carpet with the terrier mascot woven into it and, you know, pictures of past few hockey players who had you know, moved on to the NHL and, and realized their own dream. And uh, um, to, to say that I was excited, to say that it was, um, I, I just had this sense of pride in, in knowing that, that, I, that I'd gotten there, that I, that I was, it was literally hours from, from living that dream. And, um, and, and we can go to the, the next photo. Um, you know, so people will recognize this on the back of my, back of my book, but it's it's interesting just looking at that picture and uh, and that was the moment where it where it all came to fruition. That was the moment we it was two minutes into the game and and we had scored um, we had just scored and I was the next line out there and uh, and and just the moment you know a scoring the goal and, and the old Walter Brown Arena just went crazy and the pep band started playing and you know can can you, you couldn't have built a, a better moment and and just feeling the tap on the back of my shoulder and 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 going out and lining up for the face off and that that's the moment that's captured right there and and not only that but a, a little side story uh, my, my centerman that night was was Chris Drury and um, who later went on to become a three-time Olympian and won a couple of silver medals and I don't know, probably made over $50 million and, uh, worth of contracts in the NHL. And, uh, and, um, and he was good, uh, and I knew he was good, and I wanted to play with Chris. And, and, and one of the reasons I went to, to BU was to play with guys that were that talented. And, um, and then uh, next was the uh, – they dropped the puck, and we won the faceoff, and I – skated into the offensive zone just as fast as I could and, and the opposing defenseman picked up the puck and I I just sort of saw it as my moment, you know, to deliver a big show the check and make my presence known and and uh, you know, I angled myself just right and as I as I followed through the defenseman he kind of moved out of the way a little bit, which is natural. You, you generally try not to let somebody hit you squarely and and uh, and, and I just didn't hit him as, as squarely as I'd hoped, and I lost my balance, and my momentum, it took me head first into the dashboards, and I hit my head, and I, and I sort of flopped to the ice, and, and my, you know, the natural instincts kick in. You think, no big deal, you know, you just get back on my hands and knees, get back on my skates, I get right back into the game, finish my shift, and... Uh, and then there's that moment where the, the, the mind, it's the, the, the brain, it's, it's thinking, it's, you know, you're sending the messages, but, but, uh, but the body doesn't respond. And um, I've, I, I, I believe it or not, I never broken a bone in my life up until that moment. Um, never spent a day in the hospital, never had a stitch on my body. And, uh, but but paralysis it, it it doesn't take long to 
figure out that's that's what it is. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, Larry came out onto the ice and kind of knelt down and, and sort of said, what's going on? And, uh, and um, Dr. Skeptis also made his way out onto the ice uh, shortly thereafter. And, uh, and I, I remember him, you know, feeling down around my feet and, uh, and him asking, you know, can I, can I feel this? Can I, can I feel that? And, and when I say feeling down around my feet, I, I, I could just tell by from where he was speaking to me that he was uh, towards my lower body. And, and I couldn't feel anything and kind of thought, well, you know, I got all this hockey equipment on. Of course, I can't feel anything. And, but, but really the moment that um, really clinched it for me was um, I was tilted to the, laying face down. My head was tilted to the side. And I, and I started to see my, my hockey glove come moving towards me ever so slightly. Um, and, and I realized that it was my glove. And then I realized it was still on my arm. And it's one thing to not be able to move, um, but with the absence of sensation, uh, there, there is no discomfort. There is no uh, almost... Uh, that awareness of where your body is, is is gone. So when you see that hand come just ever so slightly into view and you realize that it's yours and you have you had no idea that that's where my hand happened to be. Um, when you're seeing a, your own limb uh, but not having any ability to move it or, or feel it, that was the moment where I, I realized I was, uh, this is a really Big deal, and I was I was in big trouble, and uh, um, but on on the personal side, the thing that was mostly going through that my, my mind that night, and and uh, and I had asked one of the assistant trainers to, to to find my dad, and my dad had coached me my whole life, one one degree or another, and uh, and uh, and he came walking out onto the ice, and. Uh, and, and it was the same thing as always. I, uh, I'll never forget hearing him saying, you know, come on, Trav, get up, be tough. You know, there's a game to be played. And, and that was sort of my mentality always, was to get back to the bench. And I, I hated laying on the ice. Um, and, uh, but when he knelt down, my, my whole reason I asked him to come out was, I, I, I said to him, but Dad, I, I made it. And, uh, you know, those goals that I'd written down my freshman year, it was such, such a big, big part of my life. And, uh, and, I, and I knew in moments that that, that that was it, that that was the end of the road for my, my hockey career. And, um, and then it was the neck brace, and it was the, the stretcher and the ambulance. And, uh, and when we got to the to the hospital it wasn't long before they they'd taken x-rays and and I forget the exact exact timeline um, and uh, but but when they, they they carted me off that ice and on the stretcher and just looking up at the ceiling at Walter Brown Arena Walter Brown Arena I, I knew that I would I would never play hockey again and and I you just I had an awareness that as I say, life, life was now over as I knew it. Um, the next two months, really, uh, were more or less in the intensive care unit. Um, they had to put me on a ventilator, uh, which again, for most of those two months, I was on. Um, so you go from being able to being in the best physical condition of your life, to laying in a hospital for, for months on end. Uh, they put me on the ventilator. I was no longer able to talk with the tube going down my throat, so I can't feel, I can't move, I can't talk. Um, I could smell and I could hear. That was about uh, all that was left. I couldn't eat anything. Um, and. Uh, so life becomes pretty, 
pretty basic, you know. Um, and and at the same time, over those first two months, again thinking of the, you know, where I was mentally at that point, um, I wasn't angry. I didn't cry a whole lot. Um, it's a lot of sadness, um, and and really the that's what went on the first two months was I didn't have a lot to say. I mean, granted, they they did have me pretty well heavily sedated. I, when I say a lot to say, there wasn't a lot going on in my mind. I, I would communicate by by blinking my eyes once for yes and, and twice for no, and there were certainly some frustrations with that because I wasn't a great speller, so I'd. Uh, they'd have, they had an alphabet board, a letter board, and they'd slide their finger across. I'd have to blink my eyes each time they got the letter that that uh, that I wanted to, to spell out the words. And um, uh, and then finally, it was about two months later, more or less, that I, I finally got down to the rehabilitation floor, and and I was about 173, 74 pounds at the time of my injury. And, uh, and I got down to about 123, 24 pounds. Um, lost a lot of weight um, being on the ventilator. Ended up with a large pressure sore uh, on, my, on my tailbone, on my coccyx, that prevented me from getting in my wheelchair, um, you know, to start rehab and trying to start to acclimate myself back into, into what, what reality, my new reality was going to be. Um, and eventually, um, when I got to the rehab floor, I had no sensation below my shoulders. Uh, that that hasn't changed uh, through the years. I still can't bl- move anything below my shoulders. Um, about two and a half months into my after my accident. Uh, almost three months. For the first time, I, I, I would go to the rehab floor. They'd they were, they'd roll me down in in my bed to the to the to the gym to to work out. And when I say work out, there wasn't a whole lot going on. It was it was a little bit of range of motion. But every day they would ask me. They would say, "Can you try to try to flex your bicep?" And day after day after day went went by, and and I couldn't. Couldn't do anything, and eventually I got a little bit of—I um, think they call it supination—where I could, where I could flip my my wrist over just a little bit, and uh, and that was that was all I had for mobility. And then finally one day, my my physical therapist—you know—we were doing our regular thing. She asked me to to, to flex my bicep, and she said, "I think I I feel something. I think I feel little traces of." Of your bicep firing, and uh, and and we'd also, in that time, we'd done a little bit of um, electrical stim, trying to um, work the, the the muscles a little bit, um, and I I didn't really think much of it. Um, she called over the uh, another physical therapist to to see if she could feel me flexing my bicep, and uh, and and she was she she thought she could, and, and they were. They were pretty excited. They were they were all happy for me that I was going to be able to, you know, hopefully uh, get my bicep back. And in that night, I remember being back, and in, in the they brought me back up to to my hospital room, and and I, again, I didn't think much of it. And, and I think it was maybe a day later when when my parents were there and, and the physical therapist was there, and she was talking about how I had gotten my bicep back. And I I hadn't told my parents. I and uh, and my parents were. So thrilled and excited, you know, that I got my bicep back, and, and they couldn't. My therapist couldn't believe I didn't share that with them, with my parents. And but the the truth of the matter was, I I really could have given a bleep that I had my <laughs> my right bicep back. That I wanted to play hockey again, you know. I but but at the same time, I I didn't realize. What a big deal! Just having that little bit of bicep would would have in my life, and and I'll as I go along here, I'll uh, apply how that 
the difference that it made. But um, but I, I um, the physical therapy was slow, and, and the the big pressure sore on my my backside, you know, even caused more complications. And 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 quite frankly, after little little or no progress at the hospital here in Boston, I, I eventually I flew down to the Shepherd Center, which was a, a specialty spinal cord hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, and once I got there, it was two days after I, I arrived there, I, for the first time, I finally found myself in a wheelchair. And, um, and that was sort of one of those moments when reality really sets in. Um, and uh, realizing that this is where I'd most likely spend the rest of my life. And, um, but, but at the same time, there was always that, and I've always had this natural reaction to, to always think of, you know, things could be worse. And, and for me, that, that day, I realized that being in the wheelchair was infinitely better than laying in a hospital bed. You know, that that was... This was progress. This was, this was my, my first sort of proverbial step, step forward. And, um, and, I, and I also realized that there were many people that were still much worse than I was. You know, there were, there were people at the Shepherd Center that were never going to get off the ventilator, um, that didn't have family there to support them or encourage them or insurance to cover the bills. And, and, and I always sort of tried to focus on what I, what I still had um, and not so much on, on the losses. Um, I, uh, the, the physical therapy was tedious, um, to, to say the least. Um, the thing that was great, though, I, I didn't know what, you know, when I first got that little trace of bicep, I didn't know what that would progress to. And, and I remember... I started uh, working with my physical therapist down there, and, and right away she had um, two main goals for me. And, and she said, we're going to get your biceps strong enough to do two, th two things. One, so you can feed yourself, that I would be able to literally lift my hand up, you know, with the help of uh, some adaptive equipment that I could, I could feed myself, bring food to my mouth. And then the second one was I w wanted to be able to operate the joystick to my wheelchair. And at the time, I was on a sip and puff device where literally breathing into a tube that would control whether my chair went forward or backwards or, or left and right. And, and uh, such basic, minimal exercises. I mean, literally just trying to, to flex my arm. And, and the fatigue level was incredible. I mean, I would do like three reps, and I might get my hand to about here. And then it would drop, and then I would you know, wait a minute, and then I, I might be able to replicate it a, a second time, and, and and by the third time, that that was it. I mean, the mu the muscle was exhausted. I mean, that, those those three little exercises, I felt like I'd run a marathon. I mean, I literally. Um, but but then there are the moments of of success, and and it was. Um, at the end, I was at, at Shepherd for eight weeks, and, and it was probably around the seventh week, sixth or seventh week, where finally, for the, for the first time, um, they, they'd hooked up a, a special wrist brace and a little clamp on it, and they'd clamped a bagel uh, to the wrist brace. And, uh, and I'll never forget just struggling with everything I had to get that bagel from my plate to my mouth. And, um, and I remember thinking at the time, I was like, this is, this is like being back in the gym lifting 175 pounds. But it was still, you know, this, this bagel had become 175 pounds to me, basically, just trying to get it to my mouth. And, and I knew that, that it wasn't, that my arm was just about dead tired. And so I, so I lurched out and I grabbed a bite of it. And my, uh, and, and my hand just just dropped down to the table, and uh, but but those are the, were the little moments of you know the girl the goals were no longer 
trying to make it to the NHL. It was just trying to get that piece of food to my mouth. Um, and boy, it was a lot more fun, you know, trying to make it to the NHL. But, but at the same time, um, it was, I still got that little sense of satisfaction of, of checking off that, that little goal and that little, that little resemblance of pride of, of, uh, of knowing that, you know what, if I need to, I can, I can feed myself. Um, and, uh, and then there were other breakthroughs, little breakthroughs, uh, in, in highs and lows. The, uh, I remember the first time, and I, and I talk about this in my book, I think a couple of these things I discuss in my book, but, you know, the psychosocial aspects of rehab, every time, in the hospital, whether I was in Boston, whether I was in Atlanta, there was always a comfort zone. There was also a, there was always a feeling of feeling safe in the uh, in the hospital, and um, and it was a big big deal that first time out of the hospital. And, and actually, before I progress, I, I I skipped a photo. If you want to go on to the next photo, this is this is at the uh, in the ICU, and this was this is that moment of. Uh, Everybody's trying to make the best of it. You know, you can see the smiles on the people around me. And uh, my girlfriend was there at the time, my, my parents. And, uh, you know, you can see the ventilator to the right and that Ambu bag up on top, which, I, God, I hated that thing. Um, but um, anyways, I, sorry to backtrack a little bit, but uh, uh, just trying to... Uh, I remember just trying to be there for my, for my parents. You know, I knew that, and, and my girlfriend and my, my sister, and I, I knew that there were so many people that cared about me and, and just wanted uh, everything to be okay. And, and, uh, and as, as quiet a time that, as that was for me, and um, that was always my thought for me, was I, I just I got to keep moving forward for my, for my family, for the, for the people around me. Um, but, and that, and that sort of gets me to where I was just talking about that, that first time out of the hospital, um, and, and the first trip for me was, uh, because at Shepherd they, they were trying to create different activities to get you back into society, and, and when I say get, you know, get back into society, it's unbelievable the transition again, and you, you just, I know that's why you're here and trying to get educated to understand the difference, but from going from able bodied to, to disabled to to point where you can't open a door. Um, and I remember uh, going out to the restaurant for the first time, and I think it was called the Black Eyed Pea, um, uh, you know, down in Georgia, different, uh, different menus, but, and, and for the first time I had to get in uh, in one of those one of those uh, accessible vans, but it was for you know it held like six or seven wheelchairs and uh, you know growing up I'd, I'd see people get on the in in the accessible vans and and I I really fought back the tears I because there were four or five of us that were going out to the restaurant that night and our families were going to meet us at the restaurants and. And when I got in that van and they, and they strapped down my wheelchair, they put the seatbelt across me and, and uh, it, it was such a, I almost felt almost inhumane. Like I, I felt like I was just like a, like a package being strapped in the back of the truck and just to deliver me safely to the, to the restaurant. And, uh, and there are those little moments of reality as to what your life is going to be like. You know, I'm used to hopping in the back seat of the car, you know, or front seat or driving, and and now I had no control over anything, and, and just the sounds of that that van and the squeaks of the chair and the clanging of the buckles, and you know, they got us all lined up two by two, and um, but we got there to the restaurant, and uh, 
And I got out, and I, I was just trying to be so brave for my parents. I didn't want to see how emotionally uh, upset I was. Um, we got there, and, and I couldn't open the door, you know, and somebody had to open the door. And, and we got to the, to the table finally. And, and, and again, I'd been in the hospital for four and a half months, and, and everything was set up for somebody in a wheelchair there, you know, and this is the first time. And, and I rolled up to the wheelchair, up to the table, and, and the, the, the chair was too high, and my knees were sort of bumping the front of my, the table, and, and I couldn't get close enough. And, and I felt like the, the table was 10 feet away from me, and my parents sat down and felt like they were 10 feet away from me. And, and, uh, and I, I, I just couldn't help but the tears. They just started rolling down my face, you know, that this... Again, those little moments of reality, like, you know, you, you see the, the first picture that I put up on that screen, and, and that kid could do anything. He had the attitude that he could do anything, that, that anything was possible. And then now I couldn't even grab my fork or, or feed myself. My, my, you know, my mom had to help feed me and prepare my food, and, and I was so far away from her, she literally had to kind of step up a little bit out of her chair so she could reach me. And, uh, and that was the first night out. And it was a tough night. Um, and I remember going to bed that night with the tears rolling down my face. And, but uh, then there were other experiences. Uh, there, there were good experiences. There, were, there was a time where I went to the, they had us all come and go to the airport. And uh, to, to explain to us that we could still fly and how you transfer from your wheelchair to the seat in the, in the plane and they'll store your chair underneath the plane. And, and you know, it was, uh, it was kind of, you know, at that point I was starting to make the transition. I was trying to kind of look at things in a positive way. Okay, this is, this is one more thing that I can do. We just started to add to that list of, of things that I could do, you know, from you know, the first one was I could finally scratch myself, you know, if I had an itch on my face. And then the next was like, well, I could finally, finally bring a bite of food to my face. And, and then, boy, we started to get some big ones where I could go out to eat and, and uh, you know, and, and enjoy that experience. Not the first time, maybe not the second time, but the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth time. All of a sudden, I, I had a better understanding of what to expect and how it was going to work and figure out a little, some ways to make it a little bit easier. And, and it probably wasn't until about the 15th time that, you know, that, that I was at a point where I really enjoyed it and I couldn't wait to go out to eat. Um, other little moments. I, I always tell the story about the night they invited a scuba diving instructor to the rehab pool. And, uh, you know, I didn't think I'd ever go scuba diving again after my life and uh, right after my accident. And, and, and I remember rolling down there with, with four other quadriplegics, and, uh, and all of a sudden it kind of dawned on me that, you know, all I could envision was a five of us sunk at the bottom of the pool. And <laughs> I was thinking this is going to get ugly pretty quick. And, uh, <laughs> but then they, they put me in a wetsuit, and that's no easy task, you know, uh, trying to get this body into anything. Uh, and, and with the oxygen tank strapped to my back and the regulator in my mouth, and... And uh, and then finally, I, uh, in the pool, and and the instructor grabbed me by the wrist, and it just pulled me all around from from the shallow end and and down to the deep end, and you know with that with that water and, and the loss of gravity, it you know for the first time my my body it, it finally felt at peace that it wasn't pulling me that way or this way or these you know limp heavy awkward limbs that. Now they were, now they were at peace, and uh, it was just one of those moments where I, you know, went better than I expected, and uh, made me kind of open up my thoughts that maybe there, maybe there's more that I can do with this life than than I realized, and and, and then there were other little stories. I, I've, I don't know if it's in the book, but I talk about um, down there, you know. Uh, Hunting's pretty popular down there, and they're always trying to find adaptive equipment and and, and making things possible. And uh, and there was one night where the the activities director had, had 
come and talk to me about different things. And she said, well, come down to the gym tomorrow. We'll check, got some things I want to show you. And, and they mounted a, uh, 10 minutes later, they mounted a pellet gun to my wheelchair. <laughs> and uh, I thought, this is kind of cool. And, uh, and it was, it, at the time, this was before I could, could move my arm. And, and it was hooked up to, to that same sip and puff device. And, and so that if I puffed into it, the straw softly, the, the gun, it would slowly move to the right. And, and if I sipped in softly, it would move to the left. And if I puffed in firmly, it would go up. And if I sipped in firmly, it would go down. So just using my breath, I could make it go in different directions. And, uh, and then if I, if I waited three seconds, it would go to neutral. And if I um, made a long, firm puff, it would go into the fire mode. But, and, and at the end of the gym was a bale of hay and a bullseye target. And, and I did my sipping and puffing. And, I, uh, and, and in the end, you know, it was, you know, I came pretty close to hitting the bullseye. And, and it was just one more little experience that just added to that, that, that little bit of momentum that we'd created that, all right, there's still, still life to be lived. And uh, six months after my injury, finally transitioned back to, to my house and we, we flew back into Boston and the house that I grew up up in, up in Maine, um, it was, uh, Built in 1840 and need a lot of uh, modifications and and they were still working on the the construction when I got there but and, and that you know there were there were steps forward at the Shepherd Center and then there's always those steps backward where I found myself you know my parents using a, a special lift a Hoyer lift to get me out of my wheelchair and roll me over to the bed and lower me down and and finally I was. I was looking up at that same ceiling in my bedroom that I'd looked up to for so many years, you know, and uh, but now there was medical supplies everywhere and the Hoyer lift and the and and it was another one of those moments where the, where I just couldn't help the tears from rolling down, and uh, you know realizing that this is this is reality and and it was that moment of being out of that safety zone that that safety comfort feeling of being in the hospital and. Um, and uh, and that was in April. Um, so May, June, July, August. I uh, throughout those months, I was finally I was trying to get my arm strong enough, so I had a little uh, little endurance, and I finally kind of transitioned. So I was using the joystick um, full time, and that was my big goal when I when I uh, had made the decision to return to Boston University. That I wanted to be able to use my joystick. I didn't want that straw up in my face. I wanted to. It was just one more thing that made me look even more disabled, I, th I thought, my own perception. Uh, and I, uh, in everything I've done in the 16 years, the, the one that I look back and I kind of wonder what the heck I was doing was coming back to BU. Um, you know, I, I found myself sitting in front of the same dorm that I had walked into just 10 months earlier. Um, but, but this time there was no cocky bag, there was no sticks, there were no cute girls trying to catch my eye. It was, it was me in the wheelchair and the medical supplies and, and the care attendants. And, um, and at that point, it, it's just survival mode. It's just, it's one day at a time. It's one hour at a time, really. Um, and, uh, and I remember one of the first nights going down to the cafeteria and I, and I remember rolling down, and it was packed it, over at Shelton Hall, and and uh, you know everybody's excited to be back at school, and the energy and the excitement, and people are catching up, and and I was only on campus for for really about two months, and I and I month and a half, and I never really got to know, didn't make a lot of friends. Uh, again, when you're playing hockey, you're you're with the guys, you know, uh, full time. Um, I made some friends, but. Um, and I went down to the cafeteria by myself, my care attendant, and I came out of the food line and I looked around and, and there, were, there weren't any real tables that were close by that I could get to that weren't already taken. And fortunately, a table, table cleared out and I, I rolled right up to it. My care attendant sat down and sort of prepared my food and set me up with my wrist brace and special equipment so that I could feed myself. And, 
and I still wasn't very good at it, and I'd sort of make a mess of myself, and, uh, and that was kind of hard. Um, but the thing that I noticed most was those first few times, really most of that year, was, I, was that nobody sort of came and sat down at my table. And, uh, and it, was a lonely, it was a lonely feeling. It was, you know, I was trying to figure out who the heck I was and how I, how I fit into this body, much less trying to figure out how I fit into society. And, and I'll also, you know, I'll also admit, to be honest, back then, that, that first year, there was a lot of media attention. There was a lot of, a uh, uh, bit of a spotlight put on my story. And, and I think between being disabled on a college campus and then, it's weird to even say this, but there was a little bit of a celebrity factor that, that it uh, kind of, um, it was hard, those two things, you know. And, uh, um, and I didn't have near the confidence that that kid standing by the pool had. And, uh, and slowly I, um, you know, through that first year, it was, freshman year was a hard year. But when I came back my sophomore year, I promised myself, I thought, I've got to take responsibility for this too. And, and if, you know, there's one thing that I, I encourage people to do is when you see somebody with a disability or, or if they're a little bit different, that, that you look them in the eye and, and that you put a smile on your face and, and you say hello. And, and it's amazing what, what that little interaction does sort of breaks down that, that glass barrier. And, but, but as I was saying, I learned that when I came back my sophomore year, I realized that I needed to own some of that too. That the person with a disability, you know, needs some responsibility. And, and, I, and I came back and I, you know, rather than kind of a little more confidence, and I'd, I'd look people in the eye and I, I'd put a smile on my face and say hello. And, and things uh, slowly got better. I had the confidence to leave the, the door open to my dorm room. Um, and I met some friends, and, and what I realized was, was a lot of those people at, at college and my classmates, they were dying to help out. They, they just didn't know how to approach me or, or what to say or how to do it, and, and eventually I made some friends, and, and, and finally I'd, I'd leave my care attendant back in the room, and I'd go down to the cafeteria with my friends, and they'd help feed me and prepare my food, and, uh, and, and there were those transitions that... Uh, I, I finally felt like I, I, I started to fit in. Um, I've talked a little longer. I'll go a couple more minutes here, and then I, I do want to leave some time for some questions. Um, 16 years it's been. Um, I've been, uh, I was, we had a little reception upstairs, and in my frame of mind was always, in the beginning, it was, you know, hopefully in, hopefully in five years, They'll, they'll come up with a cure. And, uh, and that came and went, and I thought, well, hopefully in, you know, in 10 years they'll, they'll get there, and, and that's come and gone. And, uh, and I'm still hopeful that, that, the sur sur that the science will continue to progress and move along. And, and, and I'm not going to play hockey again. I understand that, and I'm probably not going to be able to run and jump and do those things. But, but for me, I, I, I just crave um, a little bit more independence if I could regain mobility in, in my hands. Um, if I had mobility in my hands, I could probably be almost fully independent. Um, if I could get myself from, from my bed to the bathroom and dress, that that, that would be, for me, a cure. Um, but, but mostly what surprised me the most, and I shared this story upstairs, I, I thought I'd, in the, in the year or two after my accident, I always thought I'd give myself 15 years. You know, that hopefully they'll come up with a cure in 15 years, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't happen, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll check out. And, uh, and it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't, it's literally about a year ago that those 15 years came, and, and, uh, and I'm disappointed that the research hasn't come further than it has. But the thing that has surprised me the most is, is the overall quality of my life. Um, I have a lot of people in my life, my family, my friends. I enjoy going out to eat with them. I enjoy uh, most anything, just hanging around the house with them. Um, I, I 
I make a living as a giving speeches. Um, this is very different speech than I usually give, but um, you know, to be able to make a living it sort of helps out my esteem, my pride, uh, keeps me keeps me positive. Um, you know, writing the book was a fun experience. I, I live right here in Boston. I, I've I uh, I have 24-hour home care. Uh, the NCAA had a catastrophic insurance policy at the time, and they uh, helped cover my home care. I, that's a that's a major, major, major uh, gift. Um, it enables me to to live on my own. Um, I, I spend time in Vermont. My family are property up there. I love my summers up there. I've got three nieces and a nephew, and uh, um, I've got a lot to look forward to. And, and I'm now at a point where it used to be minute to minute and hour to hour. And, and when I first got back to BU, BU it was day to day. And now I, now I know what to expect each month and, and really each year. Uh, it probably took me seven or eight years before I got to that point where things settle out, where I could sort of start to plan my life. Um, and uh, so I, I think that the, the last photo, um, you know, I... I that kid's got a far bigger smile. I say kid, 35, 36. But uh, never, never did I think I'd have that smile on my face 15, 16 years later. Um, and, uh, you know, that, I almost get emotional seeing that. That, uh, that, that's, that was a good day. And I, and I have lots of, lots of good days. Um, and uh, and I, I think in the... the the end of my, my book, I share that, that no, I, I can't do the physical things that I used to. But I can still laugh, I can still cry, and, and, and I can still en enjoy the people around me. And, uh, and that's what all you physical therapists and occupational therapists in the room, um, that's, that's what you guys get to do, is to try to to give people back every ounce of independence, every uh, educate them on, on adaptive equipment that can change their lives. Um, because those are dark days at the beginning um, when you're dealing with somebody with such a catastrophic injury as, as paralysis. But even if you're just trying to rehabilitate, rehabilitate a knee uh, or a shoulder, that uh, this is the grand scheme of, of changing a life. But uh, it, it happens on, on smaller scales as well to, to give somebody the mobility and the physicality and, and the life that, uh, that they had before their, their injury. And it's a special, uh, it's a really special uh, career to, to be able to, to impact somebody's life uh, that way. And, uh, but in, in ending, and I, I, I hope that you want to be great. At, at what you do. If you're a great physical therapist, an occupational therapist, that, that you can do so much uh, for, for your patients in, in any of the, the, the different programs here at Sargent. And, uh, and if you just want to be okay at it or, or average, then, then you're really doing a disservice, a disservice uh, to your patients, to the people you're working with. And, uh, and I, I've, I've gone longer than I want, but I had good experiences with my PTs and OTs, and, and they changed my life. Uh, they're, they're the big, big part of, of uh, the life I live now. But I did have a bad experience with a physical therapist, and, and it quickly became apparent in my outpatient rehab that, that she wasn't prepared. She didn't know her stuff. And I knew it only because I'd had such good care, and I knew what needed to be done. And... and uh, Thank goodness I knew the difference between somebody that knew the, the goals that were appropriate and, and those that, that weren't. Um, so, all right, I gotta stop because I do wanna take questions and uh, hopefully we can go a little long. If people need to leave, I understand. But uh, are there a few, few questions? And I know we have a microphone that uh, this is being uh, uh, great. We'll, we'll put your hand up and we'll. Right after your accident, when you were like at your lowest point, um, and no one could really relate to what you were going through, what kinds of things did your family say that maybe it helped you feel better or made you feel more isolated? Um, that's a that's a great question. And uh, 
and that's a challenge. And the, the things that, that help me feel better. There is a moment, uh, and it actually can go for weeks and, and months, where there just isn't anything you can say. Uh, and I get, I get calls somewhat frequently to, to call somebody up or, or a family member, uh, somebody that's gone through a spinal cord injury. And, and I've now learned to, to really wait till a month or two after because there just has to be that grieving period. Um, and, it ha and, it, and it's for everybody, uh, my parents or my friends. And, and it's hard because I could see how badly Everybody just wanted to make everything okay. And it breaks their hearts. And I was heartbroken because if there was something that I could have said, you know, or that they could have done, you know, they would have, you know, done it. I, the, the only other thing that, the thing that I really appreciated was there were a lot of cards. There were a lot of just well wishes, some flowers, some fruit baskets. Um, those simple gestures do go a long way. Just knowing, knowing that, the, that, that people are there supporting you. Um, so there's no doubt that that just made me feel not so alone, and not, not only not alone, but knowing just how many people were praying for me and, and, and the well wishes. So th those meant a lot to me. Um, but there wasn't anything certainly early on that, um, that, that could really change. Or um, and and I and as I say, it was it's hard for both parties, knowing that people were trying so hard to put a smile on my face, but me knowing that, you know, I, I appreciate your effort, but not yet. But so, another question. Great. Yes. Uh, yes, Travis. Uh, Travis, you had uh, shared with us at the time of your accident, you had said to your dad on the ice, uh, "I made it," and you are. Uh, indeed a, uh, a BU hockey alum. I'm curious, um, in the aftermath of your accident, um, if you, you could share a few of your thoughts pertaining to uh, the role that the greater Boston um, hockey culture in general, uh, BU hockey community in particular, and perhaps a few thoughts on your relationship with Coach Parker. Sure. Uh, the hockey community is is remarkable. Uh, it is a close knit family that that takes place in those, you know, six o'clock practices and in the locker rooms, and and there's something very special about it. Um, but uh, and and certainly the the BU hockey community having a a coach that has presided over the last forty years or so of of a program is very special. He's connected. Us. He's kept everybody connected. Um, and we all feel like we're, even if we didn't play with the, each other during the same years, we're still, uh, we still have that common link through, through coach. Um, uh, my relationship with Coach Parker is probably, uh, outside my, my family, one of the most important relationships I have. I've, I've appreciated, um, his friendship, uh, uh, you know, I've, Few nights where I've I've definitely cried on his shoulder, and uh, you know it, I always had an outlet with my family. But it's nice to have somebody else that would ask the questions. I was always one of the challenges was people were afraid to ask the questions about what I could feel, what it was like, you know, what I felt about how I felt about the disability, and, and I think it's probably similar to when somebody passed away and everybody's afraid to say anything about. You know the person that passed away, and, and really, you know, I I, I wanted to, to share those things. And, and Coach Parker, he he always would ask some of the questions. Um, Chris Drury was another guy that, you know, a few nights at the dugout, you know, he would he would uh, kind of ask the questions that I knew people had, had but the, but they wouldn't answer. And uh, um, but. Uh, um, uh, you know, along with the support from the bus and New England, the whole country, and, and the, the hockey family, they did a lot of fundraising. And as I say, next to insurance, next to having family and friends, if there is some, some private 
fundraising, some, you know, having the right technology, the right computer, the right wheelchair, the right van, boy, it makes dealing with an injury like this so much easier. Um, there's already enough stress in just trying to make sure your care attendants show up to get you out of bed and ready for the day. Um, then, uh, so uh, those are little little thoughts. So I'm grateful, many different levels for the the hockey community. Somebody else, right, right behind you. If so, and if you leave your hand up, they'll move the microphone around. And um, I was wondering if in your dream, um, do you ever dream that you're walking or running or playing hockey? And in my dreams, like do I ever dream that I'm walking or playing hockey or running? Uh, early on, um, my dreams uh, in, the, in the first year or two, quite often they were they were mostly able-bodied. Um, over the years, they've, they've slowly transitioned to, um, I'm not necessarily in my wheelchair, but there's always something that's off. There's something that's wrong. I, I can't, you know, uh, it's, there's, there's some part of me that's disabled. I, you know, I, I'll be at the rank and no, I, I realize I can't skate, you know, or um, they, I used to be relieved by my dreams and, and they were fun and, and now they're, they're more of nightmares. Uh, you know, there's more freedom in my dreams, but there's, there's always something that, that, that comes back to, to my disability that's hindering me from doing what I really want. Yes. Uh, Travis, if you maybe, I was one, I'm a rehabilitation counselor, so I would be interested to know. I Hang on. Voice, so I think uh, well, <laughs> they're, okay, yeah, they're, record, okay. they're recording, so. Uh, so, Travis, I'd be interested if you could talk a little bit about, um, after coming back to BU, after your injury, um, how you chose your major, how you uh, finished school, and then transitioning sure. to work. Like, did you get support services for that? How did you make the decisions about, the, uh, you know, your major and the and right. employment? It, this is terrible. Uh, I saw Professor Powers left. He was a professor at Com, and I'm glad he left because um, <laughs> he's not going to like my answer. Uh, I didn't know you were here, Coach. Sorry, Coach snuck in. Uh, but uh, God, I didn't see you, Coach. That uh, 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 I was originally in the College of Arts and Science. I, I was originally a psych major. When I came back. Uh, trying to figure out physically what I could do um, and how to apply that. And, and two reasons I decided to go into communications. One, I thought maybe getting into radio or TV. or um, And the other thing is, is COM. I don't know if anybody's heard the acronym, but College of Optional Math. Um, <laughs> there, there are no math requirements at COM. Uh, I didn't know how the heck I was going to take a, take a math class and, and try to explain to somebody how to... Uh, how to how to do my math problem for me? Plus, you know, I only have two semesters of foreign language. I wasn't much better at foreign language, so uh, over at Com. Um, but they actually uh, they they helped kind of create a curriculum um, with some uh, public speaking courses, uh, oral presentation courses, uh, with some radio. Uh, I didn't do any TV, but um, and just sort of some mass Com classes. Uh, and then when I graduated from BU in, in 2000, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had some opportunities. I spoke at some Rotary Club meetings. I spoke at some high schools, uh, and uh, and um, decided it was something I enjoyed doing. I, I tried to work on 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 my presentation and and what my message was going to be. And slowly got a little bit better at it. And then I realized I could make a living at it. And and uh, and I've enjoyed. It. I, I have a couple different talks I used to. to High school and, and uh, students, and one for corporate groups, and uh, and, and now I, I make a pretty good living. And, and again, that always helps out the the, the confidence. Um, and uh, so, hopefully that answers your question. Anyone else? I know I don't I don't want to keep people up from. Okay, why don't we take one more question? And then we'll Is there one more question? Anybody? Any All right, uh, we good? Okay. All right. Well, again, it's it's really been a, a pleasure. Enjoy coming back to campus. Uh, just really uh, proud of how the school rallied around me. And, and as I say, there were tough days, but in the end, I, you know, I, I made a made it a success story. And uh, from from my faculty, my uh, 
Terry's up there. She was one of my uh, uh, professor here at Sargent and helped me with my, my physical therapy and my occupational therapy when I was back on campus. And, and so many people just played a, a, a little role in, in uh, making sure that, that things were going to be okay for me. And, uh, and I'll always be, be grateful for my time here at, at BU. Travis, thank you very much. This was a really wonderful, wonderful talk. Unfortunately, uh, Meredith Drench, unfortunately, Meredith Drench, who's the person who uh, endowed this lecture series for us, isn't here today because she's true. ill. But um, this is exactly the kind of uh, uh, lecture that she really wanted our students to be able to have the opportunity to hear. So I really thank you uh, for giving this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So.